Hi, everybody. What a great set of talks. I'm totally inspired. So many people doing so many great things in the world. Quite amazing. I want to start with this. This is the graph of number of image downloads for Docker. It is now stands on 800 million downloads. That's a really impressive number. It grew more than 18,000% just in the last year. My talk is about a community and how you create a community. So why am I starting with this? I'm starting with this because several years ago, when Docker started, the team decided to open source it. That decision turned out to be a quite an important decision in the history of the company. And working in a code in a community format has been quite interesting. We have learned a lot of things along the way. And honestly, we're still learning. But what I want to do today is share with you some of the lessons and some of the things we learned so you can apply to where you are with your journey in the community, in open source, or your project. First of all, obviously, it starts with a great idea. I'm sure you're all working on amazing ideas. Otherwise, you won't be working on them, right? I want to talk a little bit about what is a community. Sometimes we say, community does this, community does that. You know, a Docker sometimes they say, is the community going to be happy with this? Or are they not going to be happy? We treat it as if it's a person or a thing. But you know, it is not. Community is really a lot of people working together. They all have different backgrounds, all from different countries. They do all different things. They have different skill sets. Some of them want to contribute code. Others, they're users. Others, they want to just add tests or write a doc or add training. They all bring something else to the table. Some just individuals that work from home or you know, very passionate about your project. And others are part of corporations that do things in the projects that have more of a plan and more of a roadmap where they work with your project. They bring a lot of different things. The community is this um, an unbelievable source of knowledge. You get these expertise all around the world, knowing all these different things, and you have access to that. It's quite amazing. You can also think of the community as this like galaxy. You know, the community is usually interacts with other community. So it's kind of the community of communities. And as you work on your project, you often use other projects. And you interact in this galaxy of communities. And you give, and you get, and you're part of that system. I want to share with you a couple of stories. It is really well known that the beginning uh, of Docker, the, keep, the Google people that work on a project called Let Me Contain It For You have joined the libcontainer work. And now they are still part of the product and they're still part of Run C. On the other end, at Docker, we really use Go quite extensively. We're probably one of the most extensive users of the Go Tower package. And as part of that, we contribute a lot to that effort. There's many other things like that. So what are the different roles in the community? Well, let's take a look. In a really, really broad brush, you can think of three different roles in the community. First of all, there is a user. The users really want to use the software. They want to be successful with it. They want to have really great software that they can rely on, really good quality, predictability. You have the contributors. The contributors want to add your product. They want to sometimes change. They want to create impact to the, to the project. And then last, you have the project, the people that run the project itself. Together, this kind of forms your community. And people can have multiple hats. You don't have to belong just to one category. Let me actually mention a special category, the category of maintainers. Maintainers kind of sit a little bit in the middle. Often, they're users. In fact, maintainers often start as users because they use the software. They like it. They become contributors. Then they you know, so such a good contributors, they become maintainers. So often, they sit in the middle. They're helping running the project. They're also contributing, and they're using. 
again, there's people that are in different parts, and you know, you don't have to belong to only one circle. You know, contrary to your probably common belief, maintainers is not a very prestigious job. It's a really, really hard job. You know, you, it's a constant stream of PRs and requests, and constantly you need to review, and constantly you have to work on that. And it's a really hard job, and it's around the world. So you go out to sleep at night, and you wake up, and again, your queue is full. So every time you see a maintainer, you should thank them. And you know, and when you're in that group, you don't have special rights. When you're in a particular circle, you just truly belong to that circle. So for example, if you're a maintainer, you don't get to just like submit your code when you're doing the role of the contributor. You still have to go through the process. Your code gets reviewed by other maintainers just the same way. And yes, even Solomon, the founder of Docker, will submit PRs the same way. And yes, they sometimes get rejected. So talking about your company, I want to introduce you to two people. The first one is actually Arno. And Arno is here today. So Arno, if you can stand up. This is Arno. Arno is responsible. Stay up, stay up, Arno. Arno is responsible for Docker Engine. And Arno, are you a maintainer? OK, I want to use my own advice and say thank you. Thank you, Arno. Um, <laughs> these people work really hard. Um, and Arno is in the, the open source, the community side of Docker. One interesting fact about Arno, by the way, you've got to check in his LinkedIn profile if you haven't already. Because, you know, Arno got caught on camera wearing some Docker swag a couple of times. It got tweeted, and you know, his friends at Docker really thought he did a good job. So he voted, they voted his top skill in LinkedIn as modeling. So go check it out and add to that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, on the other end, we have Rajat. Rajat is not here today, but Rajat is responsible for one of the commercial um, teams at Docker. They, he writes commercial software. It is not open source. So Rajat often depends on the engine. And often he hits a bug, or he needs a feature, or he has a, you know, a need from there. So in a very traditional way of working, you're going to pass dependencies back and forth, requirements, documents. You're going to have conversations, align roadmaps, all of these kind of system. But in a community way of working, you just submit a PR. It does not matter you're in the same company. It goes in the same queue. So when Rajat needs something from Arno, and when his team needs something from Arno, they just submit a PR. So our internal community is just a community. It is part of the external community. Let's actually take a look. This donut is representing, first of all, you're hungry, it's representing breakfast. The second thing it's representing is that um, you know, the contributions to the Docker project in the last couple of months. And one thing you will notice that most of our contribution actually come from the outside. 77% of our contribution in the last couple of months came from the outside. And that's what you need to do when you have a community type project. You need to share. So in a traditional type of working, what do you do when you have projects, when you want to make sure it's great? You close it. You protect it. You, you know, make sure nobody can check in to your code. You put all these locks to make sure you can be really responsible. But in a community way of working, it's exactly the opposite. You open it up. You make it available. Of course, you lose some control. But you gain so much. By the way, talking about these donuts, it's a health metric. To run a successful project, you need to monitor. And you need to look at the metrics. This is one of the health metrics we keep track of. We want to have a lot of external contributions. Since we talked about metrics, let's take a look at the next set of things. When you have a productive community project, you need tools, and you need a whole system. We, in our project, use GitHub as actually the central piece. 
when you submit a PR in kind of the contribution flow, it immediately kicks off a process after that. There's a variety of bots, using Docker, of course, that kick in and start working on your PR. And they scan it, and they will immediately give you an answer whether it's a legit PR or not. One of these bots is the Gordon bot. And I need to pause and tell you about Gordon. Gordon is a turtle. And I always say, it is a real turtle. There is a turtle like that named Gordon. It lives at Docker. It actually sits not far from me. And you know, it eats grass, likes cactus, really awesome turtle. But I want to tell you, this, this Docker bot and, and, uh, and uh, Gordon, he, they work hard. Gordon works really hard for you. You should come and check it out. You should say thanks to Gordon, too, I think. There's other tools that you need. You need to stay in communication. So you have tools like IRC and other tools that you use. We talked about metrics, so you have some metric-related tools. And you know, again, the whole process that kick off at the end of the release. And when I say tools, I also mean methodologies and process, release process. In our release process, we are trained. So we leave, our train leaves in about every two months. So you know, you get your code in the train, you're good, you're not, you wait for the next train. It doesn't matter if you use GitHub or Docker as part of your community process. The important thing is that you have a lot of tooling, and you have a lot of automation in your project, and you understand the workflow end to end. But as you talk about uh, tooling, you don't, you don't want to be lost in that, because we already talked the fact that community is about people. And you want to make sure you engage with the people. And sometimes, you have to break outside of the computer, go outside of the cyber, and you want to engage with the people in real life. You have a variety of ways of doing that. And here's some of the ways that we use. We have conferences, just like this one. Or we have hack days. We just finished a three-day hack day that was global with over 2,000 participants. We also had like a Docker, uh, open source tone, and all these other ways to engage. Again, it doesn't matter how you do that. The important thing is that you engage in real life. And meetups is another way to engage, and it's an awesome way. This one is geared more toward users. Meetup is a great way for people to learn from each other, to share. Meetups are really kind of um, done by the community for the community. So often, an uh, interest group will start a meetup. Maybe it's about how to get going, or you know, a spe specific set of tools, or whatever it is. We don't dictate that. We just enable that and make it very easy. Again, it doesn't matter how, just make sure you engage with the people, engage with the community. I want to also talk about other things. Because, you know, we kind of said a lot of things that we say is like, you know, open source is so awesome, and this is so awesome, and everything is so great. But, you know, there's some negative parts too. First of all, we already said there's a lot of hard work involved, and you really need to commit to that. But there's even a dark side. And you know, there's things like cyberbullying, and you know, people that can really, um, you know, really affect the open source um, culture and the experience, and that's not good. That's no cool. You know, on the lighter side of the negative, there's other surprises that you get. We have things that we term sometimes PR bombs. Like sometimes you get a PR. Oh, I'm just rewriting half of your system in this PR. Can you please accept that? Like, oh, how do we deal with that? And then, you know, um, when you get PRs, sometimes they get rejected. When, you know, and sometimes you have to deal with, like, you know, working with people is working with people. And when you work with the community, it's just like a new order of magnitude. So, you know, like for you, when you submit a PR, it's like your pet. You grow it. You really like it, you take care of it, you really invested in it. And then you go and you submit it. You think it's a wonderful idea. But then it goes in, in a queue with hundreds and thousands of other PRs. 
and suddenly it has to work within that umbrella, and it has to interact with all these other PRs, and it has to make sense in that context, and it has to get compared to them. So, you know, it sometimes gets rejected. And, you know, sometimes people are not happy about maybe PR getting rejected, they're just unhappy on the way you treat the community. And then they tell the world about it. They will tweet about it, you know, sometimes you see it on Hacker News, or you see it in other ways. And, you know, and sometimes they belong to corporations, and they want to really get something in that's really important for their company, and maybe for a really good reason. And maybe that didn't get in. So guess what happened? They tell to the manager, and the manager tells to their manager, the manager tells the manager and the VP, and so and so. And then they call our CEO and ask about the PR. But I have to tell you something. Our CEO is not a maintainer. You're not going to get an LGTM for our CEO. And guess what? Most of the maintainers are not even part of Docker. So you have to call a lot of CEOs. So that's not going to help. But that's where we go back to the nice thing about the community. The community is this kind of, community code is kind of this even, evening the, the leveling the, the playing field. When you're part of the community, it is not, does not matter your title. It does not matter where you're from. It does not matter, you know, nobody has to review your resume. Nobody has to interview you. You can just get in and get coding. That's amazing. So overall, it is really unbalanced. It is really awesome. So, you know, birds are not singing every day at work, but overall it's good. So, to summarize, if you really want to work in a community and you're deciding that community code is true for you or right for you, you first need to make sure it's part of your DNA. You really need to commit to that. You cannot just decide and walk away. It's now there for life. We're learning a lot of things about how to build a good community project. And I said we're still learning. But you know, there probably I could summarize what I've talked about in four categories. So if you want to go and build a community type project, you might want to remember them. The first thing, it's about the people. Community is about people, and they're not all equal. The second thing is that you, know, you need to engage with people. You need to engage with them in cyber and out of cyber. Then we talked about tools. Tools are really, really critical in the uh, success. And you need tools and you need processes. And last, but first, it really starts with great idea in a great software. So I don't know where you are in your journey with the community, whether you're part of it, or you're about to be part of it, or maybe you were you know, running a community project. But wherever this is, you know, if you're not still there, go get on GitHub and start exploring. And maybe you will even find Docker. And maybe you will want to be part of that community too. And we will welcome you with open arms. But it doesn't matter what community you're part of. It doesn't matter what you run community. Go do it. And if you're already part of this, or about to become part of this whole world of communities, I want to really say thank you. This is awesome. And happy hacking.